Hello, everyone. So I'm just going to give myself a brief introduction and then we'll get started. So thank you so much for joining me. This is a part of the Meet the Curator series. Uh, and this is sponsored by the Harold S. Seabrook Charitable Trust, um, as well as the Klein Family Foundation. So um, one thing that we're gonna be discussing today is how to take care of your art at home. Uh, so just to give a brief introduction about myself, I'm Jane Jewell, I'm the curator. And um, just to get to know me a little bit, uh, I earned my bachelor's at Missouri State University and my master's at University of Kansas with a bachelor of history of art and a master's of history of art. And I've also taken conservation courses. So one thing to keep in mind is that I do not have a conservation certificate. All the knowledge I will be sharing with you, I learned through my different conservation courses, as well as uh, what I've learned from the Smithsonian. So let's go ahead and get started on this presentation. Okay. So just to kind of give you a brief introduction about what we're going to be talking about specifically, I'll talk to you about how to take care of your art. And there's a lot of different types of art. So I chose things that I thought would be very uh, broad. For example, framed works that can be typically works on paper from watercolor to pastel to um, color pencil, graphite. Um, and there, there could also be different paintings that are also framed. So we're gonna be focusing on framed artworks as well as sculpture and textiles. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to add it in the comments and um, I'll try to answer those as they come. Okay, so just to give a brief overview, we're talking about framed artworks. And whenever you choose your frames, some of you will decide to do custom frames if you have large or small works that are not within particular dimensions. Um, some of you might choose to go to your local store and just whatever frame you think looks best for you. But here are some ways that you can upgrade your frames or maybe uh, choose better for your artwork. Um, what types of frames would be best? So there's a little bit of debate in terms of framing. What should be used? Glass versus plexiglass. Um, museums have to make these decisions as well. And there is a little bit of a conundrum with which one's better. And it's really just your personal taste and what you want to prioritize. So I'm just going to be talking about um, the pros and cons of both. So with framed artworks, your options are glass and plexiglass. Plexiglass is a type of um, pretty hard plastic. Uh, so the pros of glass is that it's cheaper. It's less susceptible to scratching. So you're not likely to have a, a nail or bump into something and have it scratch. Um, and it is heavier. Now you, you can see heaviness as not being necessarily a good thing. And in some certain circumstances, heaviness is not good. Like uh, for example, shipping. It does make it more expensive to ship if you use glass, but the heaviness does make it more stable for larger works. Like let's say you have a plastic frame or something that's going to not be as sturdy. You might wanna use glass just to provide a really um, firm and stable foundation for that artwork um, so that it doesn't bend and warp if the frame is very bendable. But also it is susceptible to shattering. So that's one thing to consider that's a con. It's uh, susceptible to shattering so that can be a possible liability and it can harm others and, and yourself. It does have more of a glare than your plexiglass. And as I discussed, um, the heaviness, though it is a little bit sturdier, more stable for your larger works, it is more expensive to ship if you are concerned about shipping your artwork. Um, so next we're gonna go over plexiglass. So a pro of plexiglass is that it's lightweight, so it is cheaper to ship. There's less of a glare, and also it is clearer. Uh, just because sometimes glass has a green glare to it. One con is that it is more expensive than glass. It's more likely to scratch and it can be less stable for larger works because it is bendable. 
So if you don't have a very sturdy frame, then it won't really give you very much support. So those are a few things to consider. There is no wrong option. It's more based off of your priorities and what you think will be best for your individual art pieces. So moving on, we've talked about framed artworks and what you should have be the paneled front, glass or plexiglass. Next, we're going to talk about matting. This is all very simple in the fact that uh, whenever you're thinking about how to mat your artwork, and that is the paper backing that's behind your artwork, as well as the paper border that's around your artwork that really makes it look professional. What you're going to want to do is make sure that all your mats are archival. Archival means that it's acid free. You don't think about this very much, but everything in the earth has some form of acidity level. Something that's archival is acid free. And this is good because acid will slowly eat away at something. So if you're seeing, um, let's say, 200 year old pieces of paper, then they might be browning, it might be brittle. That's because of the acidity of the paper is causing that fragility and causing that browning. So you want something that's acid free that's going to make sure to not damage your artwork. Also, I cannot stress this enough, never use tape. Um, just because you might have a smaller work that doesn't fit directly towards the edge of your frame. Uh, so you want to have it be perfectly centered within your border. And I totally understand that you want it to be perfect in that frame, but don't use tape tape actually becomes fragile within a very short period of time and that residue is extremely hard to get off. So you don't want to 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, want to change out the frame, unframe your work, and then find a damage from the tape. One alternative that I would highly recommend is using archival mounting strips. Uh, these are acid free, the residue is not applied to your artwork, and it just really safely secures your art piece without having any sort of residue touching it. Um, and it'll make sure to keep your artwork very nice for years and years to come. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that you can Google archival mounting strips, very cheap, very affordable. You can order them online. So I'm not having you buy any extreme equipment that will cost you a ton. Another thing to consider is hardware how you're going to be mounting your frames, um, and also not just your frames, maybe your uh, canvas, um, your oil paintings, anything that have, requires any sort of hanging on the walls in general, um, this is going to be a great piece of advice for you. If you have sawtooth hangers, which is the picture on the lower right with the X through it, those are all bad. So sawtooth hangers and screw eyes, those have weak spots, and they're not going to be super secure for your artwork. So don't use those. Um, and typically, especially sawtooth hangers, that is what comes with your frames that you buy from typically a craft store or, or a store nearby. Uh, and you're going to wanna replace those with D-rings. D-rings are the lower right picture with the check mark. Those are all the good stuff, that's what you want. So D-rings are more secure for your artwork and also, if you want to have an easier hanging, um, you don't necessarily have to use just D-rings. You can also use wires um, that you loop through the D-rings and then you can just hang your piece and be done. And it'll be a lot more secure than your sawtooth hangers. Another thing to consider is whenever you're hanging your piece, don't you just use a nail in the wall. Those are not very stable. They can fall out the wall. They can't handle that much weight. Um, so instead, you can buy picture hangers, which is the picture on the left with the check mark. So that's good. You definitely want to buy that. And again, D-rings and picture hangers, you can order online. You can find it at your local stores. These are really easy things to find that are fairly cheap. And whenever you're considering your appropriate D-rings, you can look at the labels and it'll recommend the size that it can handle and the weight that it can handle. So let's say a D-ring that can handle five pounds or a picture hanger that can handle five pounds. Uh, so just think about the size and the weight of the artwork that you want to hang um, and, and choose the size of the D-ring and the picture hanger accordingly. You won't be sorry, very cheap, and you're not going to have any picture frames falling off the walls. 
Okay. So now we're moving on from framed artworks and going more towards wooden sculpture. And I'm also going to be talking about textiles. So um, one thing that you should consider whenever you have wooden sculpture is I wouldn't recommend having any artwork at, outside just as um, an art historian, it always makes me a little nervous. If you do have artwork outside, of course your metals are a lot less likely to corrode or um, fall apart over time. And you, with exposure to sunlight and with exposure to rain, of course um, you might still find corrosion because of acid frame rain. Um, metal is not indestructible. But one thing to keep in mind, if you do have sculptures, and you want them to be in your home, avoid placing them by air vents. This is very important because air vents, either hot air or cold air, you still have an influx in temperature whenever you place an object near an air vent and it switches from hot to cold. Also, typically those areas tend to have more dry air and with wood, you really want to worry about the moisture and have, preventing that wood from cracking. Another thing to consider is direct sunlight. You want all artwork in general to avoid uh, direct sunlight uh, that goes from wooden sculpture to any works on paper, oil and canvas, the sun is your enemy. Um, so if you do notice that any of your artworks are in a spot with direct sunlight, I would consider moving them to something with at least indirect sunlight. Or possibly if you really like the spot that your artwork's in, maybe consider buying a UV uh, screen that you can add to your window. Again, very easy. You can order online. And basically, this would be a UV, UV lock it blocking, um, just kind of film or layer that you can put on your window that will block out a lot of those UV rays and make the environment much safer for your artwork. Another thing to consider is checking regularly for pests. You do have to think about, especially with wood, and this is also for your framed works uh, on paper, check regularly for pests. Um, they do tend to draw attention to those little critters, and um, we'll talk more about pests later on down the road. So another thing to consider is, again, um, the moisture of the wood, making sure that you prevent any cracking. So if you do have contact information for the artist, um, maybe reach out to them and see if they would recommend any wood oil treatments, what they use, if there's any polishes that they would recommend. Um, sometimes wood does require these treatments every few years that just keeps the wood moist and well conditioned and uh, prevents cracking. But again, if you have contact with the artist, reach out to them, um, they'll know best. Also, one thing that you wouldn't really consider is storage. Don't wrap it in plastic. You might think that you're protecting it from dust or from pests and grime, but instead you have to think about um, your artwork being an organism, a living, breathing organism in some ways, because all materials need to breathe um, that are, that's organic. So paper, as well as wooden sculpture, these need to have airflow and be able to breathe and air out. And so you don't wanna cover them in plastic if you put wooden sculptures in storage. Okay, now we're gonna move on to textile storage. So textile storage, there are a few things that you, can, you should consider. And because these are really fragile materials, um, there's a few more steps than for some artworks. First, textile should always be stored clean. If you're aware of the fact that textiles are washable, then you should wash them, but don't iron them, don't apply starch. And of course, bleach. Bleach is always bad. If you have more fragile items, one thing that you should consider is not washing them, but instead vacuuming them. It doesn't mean having the fabric and pressing the nozzle really heavily against the fabric, but you know, having it a few inches above the fabric and using a low suction hand vacuum. This is for all of your fragile items. If you're concerned about the textile shedding fabrics, or possibly it has satin that is shattering, which um, satin does eventually, and silks eventually shatter, 
Um, so you have to worry about bits and pieces possibly getting sucked up by the vacuum. One thing that you can do is put pantyhose over the nozzle and that will allow you to clean the fabric um, and also catch all of those little particles that might be coming off of your textile. When storing, once it's been cleaned, if possible, store it in a flat container. If you can't, which, you know, for, for some of your large textile, if you have a very large quilt, then you can't store it flat. And in that case, fold the textile, but remember to every once in a while, refold it so that you don't have any creasing. And this will also prevent certain areas from having more damage than others because of the strain of being folded. Also, one thing that you might not be aware of is that probably once a year, every few, once you remember it, you should air out those textiles. Again, all organic materials need to be aired out. That includes your fabrics, um, wood, and textiles. And once you air it out, that just kind of allows it to breathe. Um, and it's really, really great for it. it helps prevent molding as well. Um, and also one thing to keep in mind is that whenever your paper is in a frame, it's also still allowed to breathe because you have the matte paper and um, acrylic. So again, all organic things need to breathe. That includes your paper in frames, uh, your textiles in boxes and in storage, and your wooden sculptures as well. So um, in terms of storage, what objects you should store it with. I would use archival acid-free boxes. Again, you can just type in acid-free boxes, um, archival storage, and you can find these objects online. If you don't have the ability to do that or you don't wanna spend the money on that, or let's say your grandmother had an old cedar chest that you've been using to store your quilts, um, of course, I'm not going to encourage you to not use that. I would say, though, that cedar chests, though they repel moths, are acidic like everything else. And actually, it's a type of wood that's more acidic than most. Um, so it can cause long-term damage to your textile because that acidity will eventually eat away at your fabrics. So if you do wish to store quilts or any form of textiles in cedar boxes, I would recommend um, gently covering your textile in a muslin cloth. Muslin cloths make sure that it's unbleached, organic, and muslin cloths are naturally should be acid free and this will protect the quilt um, from any acid that it will touch while in your wooden box. Um, also, just in general, whenever you're looking at your art and what you want it to touch, what you want it to be around, um, if it can be acid-free archival material, that's great. Um, please try to do so, but I do understand that um, you might not have access to this. Again, do some shopping online, see what you can get. A lot of things are actually a lot cheaper than you would think. Okay, moving on. So now we're gonna talk about environment. So this is just the environment of your home in general, regardless of what type of artwork we're talking about. The proper humidity level that you really want to aim for in your home is from 40% to 50%. Now, I would say because we're in Arkansas, that really means that in the summertime, if you want to create the ideal environment for your artwork, I would buy a dehumidifier. This will really help you reduce the humidity of your home. And just in general, it might be nice for you to live in a less muggy environment anyway. So if you don't have one, I would strongly encourage you to purchase a dehumidifier. Um, you also have to worry about low humidity levels in the winter. But I would say because we're in Arkansas and the humidity levels are pretty high, it's less of a concern in other areas. But um, if you do have a small humidifier, it's a good idea to have that run in the wintertime. Um, also temperature, we're looking at 65 to 75 degrees. This is a range that it's pretty good. You're probably not going to see any extreme damage in your artwork, but ideally you should have your temperature be from 70 to 72 degrees. And this will prevent any warping, drying out, um, anything like that. So I'd strongly recommend 70 to 72 degrees in your home. Also, again, as I've discussed before, avoid placing your artwork in areas that receive direct sunlight. The sun is not your friend. Um, if you can place in, a, in an area that has indirect light, great. 
um, even better by a UV blocking film that you can put on your window as we talked about earlier. Couldn't say it enough. Also, spray your home regularly for pests. And you might need to increase it in the summer months just because in the summer, a lot of bugs aren't dormant anymore as they are in the winter. They're out and about, they're hungry, and they're ready to chow down on your beautiful artwork, which I would just absolutely hate to see. So, and remember to try to increase your spraying of those um, different chemicals, but make sure, of course, these are chemicals. So avoid spraying around your artwork. Um, so keep that in mind. Storage space. So we've talked a little bit about textile storage, wooden storage. This is just storage in general of your artwork. Your storage spaces should be clean, they should be cool, they should be dry, and they should be dark. These are spaces that should not have drastic changes in humidity or temperature. And this might make things a little difficult for you because natural storage spaces in a home are your basements and your attics. The one downside is that basements tend to be damp whenever it rains or possibly attics can have drastic changes in temperature, uh, hot in the summer, cold in the winter. So there's a, there's a few things that you can do to try to make these environments much better. Uh, I would say if you want to store your artwork in a basement, I would recommend having a dehumidifier in your basement to make sure that those humidity levels remain low. Of course, if your basement floods, don't put your artwork down there. A dehumidifier can't help with that. Um, with hot and cold attics, maybe consider having some sort of um, air conditioner or heater in those summer times. Again, maybe a dehumidifier or something to help um, just kind of create a consistent environment with temperature and with humidity. But of course, the most ideal thing would be to have not a basement and not an attic as your storage space. Possibly consider a cool, clean, dark, dry closet, or maybe if you have an entire spare room, I know that's ideal, but uh, definitely a closet over an attic and a basement. Okay, so one last thing that we need to discuss that I briefly talked about in environment is pests. So pests, one thing that you need to think about is a visible exit and entry hole for pests. Now, this is something that you need to think about with every object in your home that can be considered artwork that isn't made of metal. Pests can eat through almost anything, oil, uh, canvas, paper, frames, your wooden sculptures, your textiles, they can get into everything. And once they get in, they're hard to get out, but not impossible. So I'm gonna help you take care of them. So you of course need to see, okay, do I have to worry about pests? Yes or no. So visible exit and entrance holes are really important to look for. And I have a picture of some of the pest chambers. Now, of course, also if you see waste around your frames, like let's say, you have a frame and it has some visible holes, but you're not sure. Maybe you see a little bit of sawdust around your frame. That could actually be a sign of the pest waste. Maybe you see the specimen, it's, the specimen itself outside of the frame, a little critter's body. That 100% means that you have a problem. So what are your courses of action? There are two methods that I have. I would say freezing is a little bit less invasive um, than some of the other ones. Some you have fumigation. I wouldn't recommend fumigation because that does use chemicals which can harm your artwork. So I would recommend either freezing your object or what's called anoxic treatment. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Both of these methods do not use chemicals. So freezing the object, you should carefully wrap the object first. This is whenever your muslin cloth is again going to come in handy, unbleached, organic, without acid. And you're going to put that in your freezer, either your deep freeze or your um, or just your, your kitchen freezer, as long as it's cleaned out properly. Um, and you're, you're going to want to do that for 72 hours. Now, something else that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure to have it properly thaw out. This will kill most pests. Of course, if you're noticing that they're still 
uh, a little some bodies. If you're noticing that and you, you're worried about it, then you know feel free to freeze the object again. Um, again, this is this is pretty much a not a very invasive thing, but it it's easier to be done with your smaller objects that you can fit in your freezer. If you do have a deep freeze, then you can freeze larger objects. Um, but again, some people are worried about size. Another method is using the anoxic treatment. That's whenever you place an artifact basically in an airtight bag for eight to 14 hours. Once you cut off that oxygen level for a few days, um, some critters are a little bit more hardy than others. So you're going to wanna really give it eight to 14 days. If you can allow 14 days, I would. Um, so this will allow all of your critters to basically die from lack of oxygen. So one thing that's really important is once you wrap your object with this plastic, make sure that no air can get in. It's absolutely airtight or else it's not going to work. So both of these methods are non-invasive. They don't use chemical. I would say both of the downsides is that you're limited with space. Um, you're limited in terms of the size of your freezer, if you can fit your object in it. Um, and also the size of your plastic bag and if it can fit around your object. So I would say uh, those are probably the, the objects that I would recommend the most. Uh, but of course, if you have larger objects that you're concerned about pests, um, I would really try to consult your local conservationist. So that brings us to things to remember. Sun and moisture are your enemies and you want it to be consistent. So avoid the sun as much as possible. No UV rays or as little as you can manage in your home. Moisture, you do need moisture, especially with wood. If it's dry, then you're going to have cracking. If you have canvas or any sort of wooden frame, then you might see warping from lack of moisture. So you do want some, but you want it to be consistent. Again, in the 40% to 50% range. Acid is bad. So if you're looking at objects, try to make sure that it's acid free. Uh, that comes with your matting, that comes with um, any sort of material. So storage boxes, um, you want to make sure that this is acid free to really have it last as long as possible. Also, never do anything or use any products that are not reversible. So no super glue, no tape, nothing, no chemicals, nothing that you think will do potentially damage that you can't reverse. Um, and another thing that I would recommend is that if you have any issues, if you have any questions and you're not really sure where to go, consult your local history museum, your local historical house, historical society. There's a lot of experts in this field who are more than happy to help and give you a little bit of advice of how to take care of your artwork. Also, consistency is key. Even if you're leaving for vacation, Keep your temperature at the same level. Don't have it decrease or increase by any large amounts. Um, keep the moisture consistent and just take care of and love your artwork. And um, I really hope that you learned some things. If you have any questions, feel free, feel free to let me know. And uh, yeah, post a comment and I would be more than happy to have another presentation. So thank you so much. Again, um, my name is Jeannie Jewell. I'm the curator of the Arts and Science Center for Southeast Arkansas, and this is how to take care of your art at home. Thank you. I hope you guys have a good rest of your day.